Welcome to St. John and the Beloved Disciples presentation of Catholic 101. This evening's series is the first of three, and this will be on the book of Genesis. As we come together, I am Father Rich, and I will be the main presenter this evening. I am assisted tonight by Kathy Boyer to my right and Debbie Sayer to my left. Let us begin with a prayer. Our prayer is from the book to the uh, from St. Paul to the Romans. How deep are the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God? How inscrutable his judgments. How insearchable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has given him anything so as to deserve return? For from him and through him and for him all things are. To him be glory forever. Amen. Tonight is our first session. And tonight we begin with the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. This evening, our focus will be on the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis, which cover the time from creation through the time of the Tower of Babel, prior to the patriarch Abraham. Subsequent sessions, the following two weeks, will pick up at that point and cover the remaining patriarchs of the book of Genesis. Genesis is the first book of the Bible, and it deals with first things, creation. And then it progresses the primeval history of the human race from that time. The question always comes up is, who wrote the book of Genesis? In ancient times, it was thought to be written by Moses. But modern scholarship says that's not very possible, given some of the information in the Pentateuch, of which Moses was thought to be the author, happened after his death. Scholarship today indicates that there was a number of authors involved in the writing of the book of Genesis and the other books of the Pentateuch. The modern theory is that of there's four distinct sources. They're called the J, E, P, and D sources. The J is called the Yahweh source and that is a source that is associated with the southern kingdom of the Holy Land, called Judea. This is where King David and King Solomon would have reigned, and it dates from about their time, the 10th century before Jesus Christ. A second source is that of the Elohist tradition, and that is centered in the northern part of the Holy Land. And this is dated from about the 9th century before Jesus Christ. A third source is the priestly source, and this dates from the 6th century before Jesus Christ, and seems to be the prominent editor of the whole Pentateuch, who brought these different sources together and wove them into one. And the final source is called the De De or Deuteronomist, and this is primarily found in the book of Deuteronomy. Another characteristic of the book of Genesis is an emphasis upon genealogies, a listing of the ancestors, those early humans from generation to generation. This is highlighted by giving emphasis to certain of them, such as Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, later Noah, and finally moving up toward Abraham. In each case, there's usually 10 generations spacing them apart. And the age of these early humans is incredibly long. We'll talk more about that later. And there's also an emphasis upon laws and rituals. These will be things we notice as we go through, starting tonight, the book of Genesis, and we'll see more and more in the coming lectures as well. So we begin with creation. And the first thing we need to say about creation is there isn't one account of creation, rather there are two. And the first account of creation begins with chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 1, and continues throughout the entire part of chapter 1, up to and including the first four verses of chapter 2. And then the second account of creation follows directly after that, 
and is the rest of chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. These accounts, both dealing with creation, approach it from different angles and have different sources of emphasis and give different pictures of God even. One thing to keep in mind in the midst of all this is God is involved in the writing of the book of Genesis. God worked in conjunction with the human authors and the human authors definitely gave a flavor to it from their per per personal viewpoints. But God is there to guarantee the truth of everything written. And that's always something we want to keep in mind even when we run into what seems to be contradictions in some of these accounts. Somehow, there's a religious truth buried within. The other thing is to keep in mind is, Genesis is a religious book, first and foremost. It does contain history of some sort, but it is not meant to be taken as an accurate history as we expect here in the 21st century, with all the details checked and confirmed. The purpose of the book of, of Genesis is to keep focus on the, the dealings of God with humanity from the very first moment of creation down through the subsequent generations up to and including the patriarchs of the Bible. It's a religious history, de not detailing event by event, but rather showing the interrelationship and the religious principles that underlay the whole thing. So with that in mind, Let's look at the book of Genesis, chapter 1. And let's read from the beginning, which says, In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless wasteland, and darkness covered the abyss, while a mighty wind swept over the waters. There was something there. A formless wasteland in darkness. That's all there is until God began creation. And how did he begin it? With a mighty wind sweeping over the waters. Does that have significance, the powerful wind over the waters? Think of the powerful wind on the day of Pentecost. Oh. Who was that wind? Yeah. Now, the Old Testament would never identify this with the Holy Spirit. Rather, perhaps, it would see this as the breath of God blowing on the water, the breath of God that gives life. And so life is going to begin at this point on this first day of creation, but it will take specific forms on the subsequent days of creation, day by day, event by event. In chapter one, verse three, we read, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. The darkness is pierced by the light. God saw how good the light was. God then separated the light from the darkness. And God called the day light, and the darkness he called night. Thus evening came and morning followed the first day. First day of creation. I think we're familiar with that pattern that says there were six days of creation. This is day one. Day two, three, four, five, and ultimately six follow. And then we come to day seven. On day two, it's a matter of there's water and the sky. Day three, there's going to be a separation of land and sea, pronouncing the boundaries between one and the other. We think of them as coastlines today, but it could also be the shores of a lake or also the banks of a river. So there's a separation between the two. Before that, apparently, it was just a mismatch and a mess. And now God's putting order into creation, step by step, day by day. These three days, first, second, third, are the creation of the environment, the background, you might say. Because as yet, there's no individual life, such as animals, birds, and even humans. These will come in subsequent days. And so then, we go on. Day four, God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate day from night. Let them mark the fixed times, the days and the years, and serve as luminaries in the dome of the sky to shed light upon the earth. And so it happened. God made the two great lights, the greater one to govern the day, the sun, and the lesser one to govern the night, the moon, and, the, and the, then he made the stars. 
God set them in the dome of the sky to shed light upon the earth, to govern day and night, separating light from darkness. And God saw how good it was, evening and morning followed the fourth day. Now the world is sort of together, and in days five and six, it will begin to be populated with life. On day five, the fish and the birds. On day six, we read, God said, let the earth bring forth all kinds of living creatures, cattle, creeping things, wild animals of all kinds. And so it happened. God made all kinds of wild animals, all kinds of cattle, all kinds of creeping things of the earth. God saw how good it was. Then God said, this is still the sixth day, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the cattle, and over all the wild animals and all the creatures that crawl on the ground. God created man in his image. And in the divine image, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And that's something that might be surprising because we're used to the story of Eve being formed out of Adam's rib. Yes, that story is in the Bible, but it's in the second account of creation. The first account of creation is this. This is the direct creation of God right from the beginning. So male and female both exist on that sixth day of creation, created by God as part of his first effort and work. God blessed them in saying, be fertile and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all living things that move on the earth. God also said, see, I give you every seed bearing plant all over the earth and every tree that has seed bearing fruit on it to be your food. And to all the animals of the land, all the birds of the air, and all the living creatures that crawl on the ground. I give all the green plants for food. And so it happened. God looked at everything he had made and found it very good. Evening came and morning followed the sixth day. Two things to notice in that account of the sixth day. And this is right at the end of chapter one. And that is this. First, God gave the humans plants, fruits to eat, not meat. There's nothing said about meat at this time. They're going to be vegetarians, at least for a while. Later on, meat will enter into the diet by divine command. And the second thing is, God looked at everything he had made on the sixth day and said, this is very good. This is very good. God is extremely pleased with this. And then the first account of creation is summed up at the beginning of chapter 2 and says, Thus the heavens and the earth and all their array were completed. Since on the seventh day God was finished with the work of he had been doing, he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had undertaken. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work he had done in creation. Such is the story of the, of the heavens and the earth at their creation. End of the count, the first account of creation. Study says this account can be traced to the priestly tradition. And a real clue of that comes in in the six days of creation and the fact that God rested on the seventh day which is the cycle of work and rest that was expected of the Jewish people working the first six days of the week, Monday through Saturday, Friday, excuse me, Sunday through Saturday, Sunday through Friday, resting on the Sabbath, the seventh day, the day of rest. And so this is a way of the priestly teachers as they form this account to say, this is something that has its roots even so far back as creation itself. Therefore, we must practice it faithfully and forever. These are things there. And there's one other thing to notice about the first account of creation, and that is God is doing this hands off. He says simply, let there be, and by his word, things happen. 
So this is an all-powerful God, transcended far above human life, looking down from above and saying is, this is what I want, bingo, make it happen. He's making these things out of nothing. And the power of his word makes life and the fullness of creation come about. So there's a, there's a whole part here that brings that out very clear. Now with that in mind, we have to close the book on the first day style of creation and take a look at the second because it will show the creation of everything but in a quite different way. And this begins in chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 4. And most Bibles will mark this as the second story of creation. At the time when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, while as yet there was no field shrub on the earth, and no grass on the field that had sprouted. For the Lord God had sent no rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the soil. But a stream was welling up on the earth, and, was, and there was watering the surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man out of the clay of the ground, blew into his nostrils the breath of life, and so the man became a living being. Yeah, the, the grass again. Mm -hmm. like the the powerful wind over the waters from the first one, and now we're having the, him breathing breath into the man. Yes, and of course, this is much more personal. He's hands on, he's making, he's molding him. Exactly. From the clay. Right? Yes, yes. And the other thing is, there's already something there. There's already water and streams. And clay. And, and clay, and so the clay is moist, like you could do yourself if you do pottery. You pick up the clay, mold, shape it, and form it that way. And this is what God's done. So this is a very hands-on God, literally. Mm -hmm. He's involved with the creation with his own fingers, shaping, farming, molding this first man. And then he takes him, like one would do artificial respiration, blows life into him, and the man comes alive. Now that he has a living man, but it's still a desolate landscape, he's got more work to do. And so it goes on. Then the Lord God planted the garden in Eden, in the east, and he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground, the Lord God made various trees grow that were delightful to look at and good for food, with the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Those trees will become pretty important later, both of them. And these are the only two trees that are named in the Garden of Eden. The rest, they're just trees, food for the humans there, right? Except at this point, there is only one human, the first man. So we're at that point. Now that God has brought the man alive, he sees he's by himself and he says, well, he needs a companion. Does he make the woman yet? Not yet. First, he's going to try something else. Down at verse 18 of chapter 2, it says, The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a suitable partner for him. So the Lord God formed out of the ground, here again, the hands-on approach, get the clay and start shaping, molding, and making things, various wild animals and various birds of the air, and brought them to the man to see what he would name them. Whatever the man called each of them would be its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, all the birds of the air, and all the wild animals, but none proved to be the suitable partner for man. It's like he's got a lot of pets, but he doesn't have a soulmate. So at verse 21, God tries again. He says, it says, the Lord God may cast a deep sleep on the man, and while he was asleep, he took out one of his ribs, closed up the place with flesh. The Lord then built up into a woman the rib he had taken from the man. And when he brought her to the man, the man said, This one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of her man this one has been taken. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one body, because originally they came from one body. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. End of the stories of creation. Now, why is there two stories? 
It's two different traditions. And rather than one being dropped, it seems that both were retained and utilized. So which one was written first, the Yawas, the second one? To say that it was written first, I'd rather say it was put together first. Okay. Because chances are it wasn't written down in the beginning. It would have been passed on by word of mouth, generation to generation. Because writing materials would have been scarce, and the ability of people to read and write would have been rare. Okay. But by passing it down, pretty much sitting around the campfire at night, telling the tales of the creation, would have indelibly put it into people's memories. They would have cherished the story, preserved it, and it was passed down until finally it was written and it edited into the book of Genesis. So it was definitely the second one. But you see again, there's a very different opinion of God in this one. Because this is a God who is sort of kind of like us, but much greater, of course. But he's there molding and forming things out of the ground. Whereas in the first account, God says, let there be, and there is. Mm -hmm. it's creation from nothing. But here's creation using what's there and forming and giving it life. So there's two different approaches. I had a thought, Father, that I was going to ask. With the first story, God created everything before he created man. Right. Second story, he created man first and then created everything else. So is that, what's the significance of those, or is there a significance, or like is it the tradition that it came from that that the, the man was first and then the animals came and then the woman came? Is it because I think I read somewhere that it was like a patriarch, that it may have come from a patriarchic background where the, the man is, the, but I don't know. Well, there's two, ways to, there's two ways to look at this, mm -hmm. and, each, and each of those is represented in two accounts. The one is, in the first account, man is the pinnacle, the summit of creation, the best to last. Very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Just and at least that statement, yeah. he's, right. this is very good. very good. In other words, God's working up to this step by step. To the big finish. To the you know, <laughs> big finish, the finale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the second story, God starts with the man and then looks at what man needs and provides it step by step by step until he finally founds the proper helpmate. Man is happy at this point, content, and God says, good job. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's a different orientation. Mm -hmm. But in the end, the message is the same. Mm -hmm. The human being is the peak of creation. This is what makes the whole thing go and flow. Mm -hmm. Now everything's beautiful at this point. But not for long. We go into chapter 3. And this is going to deal with the calamity in the Garden of Eden. So we introduce another character here. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals that the Lord God had made. The serpent asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat of any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. It is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, you shall not eat it or even touch it lest you die. The serpent said, you certainly will not die. No, God knows well that the moment you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God who knows what is good and what is bad. Now, is the serpent lying? No, not really, because that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the way, the serpent in this account is not necessarily the devil who's trying to cause trouble, but he's more of a questioner who's challenging at this point, the woman, and eventually, of course, the man would be likewise challenging, and they basically succumb and bite into it, and bam. But see, the temptation was here is to go beyond our human state and to be like God, and that's going to be the problem. They understood death is something they didn't want to avoid, but they didn't know what death was. 
But the thing here is the temptation is to try to be just like God. And you know what? That's a universal temptation, and don't we try it ourselves? Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, then he keeps telling us we need to be like him, but not, not in that not way. Not that way. <laughs> yeah, we are made in his image, but not with right. equality. Yeah. In other words, we're reflections of God, we aren't God. Not for the power mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. Yes. So the fruit on the tree, of course, is good, it's beautiful, and it will provide wisdom. But maybe more than you can handle. And that, that's the thing. So they eat the fruit. And as it says, the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized that they were naked. They had been naked for quite a while. And apparently it was. That's just the way it was. They didn't. Didn't, no question about it. But now it's a problem. And so they sewed together big leaves and made loincloths for themselves. They felt the need to cover up. But it's covering up in more than just that way of clothing. Because prior to this, they were on really close with God. God would come down in the evening, twilight, walk around with them, have a chat, you know, how to go today, you know, just chit chat. And they're very comfortable doing this. Naked, no problem. Always, you know, when I get to this one, I always remind parents to think of when they had little children. You know, the, the one, fast, twos, and three, three-year-olds. Yeah. Why bother with these clothes? I'm having a good time. You know, yeah, they're running yeah. around. And it's, it's no big deal to them. They're having fun. Right. And we're all saying, uh, no, come on, we got to put clothes on. It's yeah. like, I want to. So this is kind of their attitude. But all of a sudden, now they grow up. Their eyes are open. And they try to hide. They count as this way. When they heard the sound of the Lord God moving around the garden at the breezy time of the day and the evening, the man and his wife hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called out to the man and asked him, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Tip off, something's wrong here. Who told you that? Who told you that you were naked? You have eaten then of the tree of which I have forbidden you to eat. I'm caught. Red hand. That's what happens. The man replied, The woman whom you put here with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, so I ate it. The Lord God then asked the woman, Why did you do such a thing? The woman answered, The serpent tricked me into it, so I ate it. Passing the buck, he to she, she to the serpent, down the line. Doesn't get them off the hook, though. Their relationship with God has changed. And basically, it's lost. And why was that done? Because they tried to become gods, and they couldn't do it. And this caused them to lose much. And by the way, we'll see that again. There'll be another time when this violation of that division, the separation between God and humanity, will come out to the fore. And it'll be again to the loss of humanity. It'll come up in the book Tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. So what's the punishments for this? There are consequences. By the way, this is a footnote. Nowhere in this account is the woman accused of committing the first sin. They did it together. This was joint responsibility. They both were involved. And so the punishments for the violation will affect both, each in their distinct ways. And when you listen to these punishments, you have to understand that today, this is a normal part of human existence. But prior to this, it was not. And this was something lost because of the loss of being in the Garden of Eden. And so the Bible here is explaining how come this stuff has happened. And they're basically saying is, it's because our ancestors sinned when everything was beautiful, good, and comfortable. And we suffer because of it. Catholics in their tradition refer to this as original sin. But look at the things that come up at this point. These punishments first are men and women attracted to each other sometimes to their grief. 
why some tried to dominate others. Instead of a spirit of harmony and mutual respect and equality, now there's boss and slave are dominant and be oppressed. Why there's a need to wear clothes, whereas before there was no such need. Why is childbirth painful? Why is work difficult? And again, think of people who are farmers who are working in the fields. No power equipment back then. If the ground has to be hoed, you're going to have a busy day. If harvesting comes, it's by hand. Tough work. Why the snake crawls on the ground? Because prior to that, apparently that wasn't the case. Think about that. Yeah. And why humans die? Because that was part of this. You will know the difference between good and evil <coughs> and the consequence of eating it is death. And so humans, when they die, will be returned to the earth from which they were originally made in this account. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. <coughs> God punishes the people for their sins, but God does not abandon them. For instance, they had loincloths made out of fig leaves. God now provides them with clothing so that their shame may be covered. God provides balance even to their changed lives. But they are lost from the Garden of Eden. And they have to leave lest they eat <coughs> the tree of life. That's why they had to go. They can't go back. So this is, explains the human situation in which we come into and take, well, I wouldn't say take it for granted. We, we just simply have to deal with it. There's nothing else that can be said and done. It leads us to the fourth one, fourth chapter. And this involves Cain and Abel. And we know the outcome of this story again, too. Mm -hmm. It's going to have a bad ending. So now that they're out of the garden, the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next she, next, she bore his brother Abel, and Abel became a keeper of the flocks, while Cain, a stiller of the soil. So you've got the herdsmen versus the farmers, which is the classic dispute in ancient world, because they're both going to be involved on the land, each with separate purposes and separate needs from it. And sometimes this is going to result in conflict situations. And a lot of times that's still true today. It even happened in the Americas, you know, with those who were trying to plant crops and those who were herding cattle. So it's, it's a classic, you know, tension there. So we have this incident then where each Cain and Abel offer a sacrifice to God. And for reasons that aren't explained, Abel's sacrifice is accepted, whereas Cain's is not. And there's, never, there's not an explanation going on here. There's nothing to say, why is this, why is that? Was Cain this or that? It's all kind of like saying, we're trying to figure it out. But see, that's kind of a pre, pre uh, cursor of later when the elder son, who you would expect to be the one who inherits, keeps getting set aside by the younger son. It happens again and again and again. God always has a different twist on the plan than when we expect. <clears throat> so Cain is frustrated by this, and he takes out his wrath on Abel. Abel is killed. And then we get into that whole account here. It starts at chapter 4, verse 8. Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out in the field. And when they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother Abel? He answered, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the soil. Therefore you shall be banned from the soil that opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. If you till the soil, it shall no longer give its produce. You shall become a restless wanderer on the earth. 
And he said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. Since you have now banished me from the soil, and I must avoid your presence and become a restless wanderer on the earth, anyone may kill me at sight. Not so, the Lord said to him, If anyone kills Cain, Cain shall be avenged sevenfold. So the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone should kill him on sight. Cain then left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So he, he can't grow anything. Mm -hmm. So how is he expected to eat? It's not answered. Okay. I mean, there's certain things in here that aren't answered. That's one of them. But again, you see another alienation level at this point. Cain has to leave. He can't stick around. But he has like a special mark so people know that they can't. They, they know he's under the protection of God. God. <clears throat> In other words, if you touch Cain, you answer to God. And that's enough to intimidate the people to avoid Cain. So what you have here is separation. You have, well now Abel's dead. And Cain's being separated from Adam and Eve. And so you're going to have two lines of people who are now going to be in conflict. And that's going to be one of the themes of this early thing, where there's a constant conflict between the descendants of these early ones because of something that happened in the life of their ancestor. So at verse 17, we get into a section that's marked as the descendants of Cain and Seth. Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. Cain also became the founder of a city which he named after his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Erod, and Erod became the father of Mehujael. Mehujael became the father of Mehusael, and Mehusael became the father of Lamech. Now watch how things get worse at this point, because there's going to be the start of a cycle of evil here, which is going to get worse and worse, deeper and deeper. <clears throat> Lamech took two wives. That's a bad sign right off the bat. Okay. The name of the first was Ada. The name of the second was Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabel, the answers of those who dwell in the tents and keep cattle. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the answer of all who play the lyre and the pipe, musical instruments. Zillah, on their part, gave birth to Tubalakane. The ancestor of all who forged the instruments of bronze and iron, the sister of Tubal-Cain was Naama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. The wives of Lamech, listen to my utterances. I have killed a man for wounding me, a boy for bruising me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, Lamech seventy-sevenfold. If you think my father would, if you think Cain was bad, you look at me. I'm going way beyond him. So he's a real, a real bad guy. He's going to be a bad guy. But you see something in the descendants of Cain. They're city dwellers, and they're beginning to develop some level of technology. Blacksmith, musician, things like that. Some of these skills are being explained as being a heritage from the sons of Cain. See, again, the Bible is going back and explaining where did this stuff come from? What came from here? Mm -hmm. These kind of things. Where did evil come from? What came from people like Lamech and Cain and so on? Explaining that in the past. So, this is what's going on at that point. And so, when we look at chapter 5, we're going to run into one of those extensive genealogies, which is going to link up the descendants of Adam and Eve to the descendants who will culminate with Noah. And there's basically about 10, ten generations here. It's just an arbitrary number. Is this historical? Not in a sense that we think of history. Like you could go back and check birth records and death reports. None of that stuff was available back then. <clears throat> so that wasn't there. But the point of this is to link these major figures together and show the descent of the world deeper and deeper into evil. And eventually it's going to bottom out, and that sets up the story of the Great Flood. So when you look at chapter 6, things are coming down. 
And you look at chapter 6, verse 5. <clears throat> when the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth and how no desire that his heart conceived was ever anything but evil, he regretted that he had made man on the earth. His heart was grieved. This is the Lord. After, after he, made God, he made man and it was very good, mm -hmm. now he's grieved about man. Because it turned out so badly. Okay. Yeah. So there's God's very interest in this. And he says, what can I do? Everything I've tried has failed. They keep twisting it in the wrong direction. And so he regrets that. There's something seriously wrong here. Because at this point, God's saying this, I'm not going to let this continue. So the Lord said, I will wipe out from the earth the men whom I have created. And not only the men, but also the beasts and the creeping things and the birds of the air. For I am sorry that I made them. But Noah found favor with the Lord. Only Noah. And Noah was a descendant of Adam and Eve. Naturally. Seth. Yes. Yes. Their son Seth. Yes. So Seth is the link from Adam and Eve to Noah many generations later. And see, that's what those genealogies do. They forge these links so we can see where they're coming from. But remember, Cain's tree's out there too. Right. And that's going to be a different flock of sheep for sure. And they're going to be competing. Th these are the descendants of Noah. Noah, a good man and blameless in the age. For he walked with God and begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. So here we got it. These are the only good people on the earth. The rest are in deep trouble. In the eyes of God, the earth was corrupt and full of lawlessness. When God saw how corrupt the earth had become, since all mortals had depraved lives on the earth, he said to Noah, I have decided to put an end to all the mortals on the earth. The earth is full of lawlessness because of them, so I will destroy them and all life on earth. And the vehicle of destruction will be the great flood. Only God is worthy. So now the preparations for the flood begin. Actually, the only person who needs to prepare is Noah. He's got an ark to build, and he's got to, you know, get everybody on board who is meant to be saved. Because this is going to be a wipeout, and only those on the ark are going to be left. And they're going to have to be have everything they need. To start creation over again. It gets pretty um, detailed of what he, God told Noah mm -hmm. in there to how to build the ark and yes. how big to make it, mm -hmm. and who to bring on, what animals and things to bring on, and it, that kind of thing. It does. So many of this and so many of that. Mm -hmm. And at times in here, we're going to see the merging of these two traditions again, where certain accounts. Two accounts. Are repeated with a slightly Noah. different way <clears throat> so that it wasn't just, you know, somebody wrote it down twice from the same place. Okay. Something was taken from here, something was taken from there. So, this editor who pulled it all together is making use of a lot of material and he's weaving it all into a straightforward story, sometimes with some repetition. So, preparations for the flood make yourself an arc of gopher wood, put various compartments in it and cover it inside and out with pitch to make it watertight. This is how you shall build it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. <laughs> Traditionally, cubits is measured at 18 inches. Wow. So that's like 450 feet long. Yeah. That's a pretty good sized boat. Yeah. Make an opening for daylight in the ark and finish the ark a cubit above it. Put an entrance in the side of the ark, which you shall make with Bottom, second, and third decks. Maybe there's no more gopher wood because Noah used it all to make this big ark. <laughs> Maybe so. And I'm not really sure what gopher wood is anyway. Let me look that one up. Yeah. Right, go right ahead. I'm sure you'll find something, but I don't know how accurate it may be. Okay. On my part, I am about to bring the flood on the earth to destroy everywhere all creatures in which there is breath of life. Everything on earth shall perish. But you, I will establish my covenant. You, your sons, your wife, and your son's wife shall go into the ark. So how many people are going to be in the ark? Eight people. 
Of all other living creatures, you shall bring two into the ark, one male and one female. Of all the birds, and all kinds of beasts, and all kinds of creeping things, two each shall come into the ark with you to stay alive. Moreover, you are to provide yourself with all the food that is to be eaten, store it away, and it may store provisions for you and for them. So this is going to lead to a lot of food. <clears throat> Noah did and carried out the commands the Lord had given to him. Now, here's where it doubles up when you go to chapter 7. You get this idea. There's two, there's two stories going on here to be emerged. They're similar stories, but they're not the same. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your household. For you alone of this age I have found to be truly just. So the household's the same. For every clean animal, take with you seven pairs, it says this time. Seven pairs? Yes. The clean animals. Male and his mate. And of the unclean animals, one pair. Clean and unclean. How That's. Do, how do you know the difference? Jews would. Jews oh. Would. Yeah. Okay. This is the uh, dietary laws. Right. Okay. So this is, again, this is a tip off that this is coming from the priestly code because these were the guys that maintained those dietary laws. Okay. Mm -hmm. So clean animals, unclean animals. You take two pigs, but seven cows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because the cow, cows are clean, the pigs aren't. Mm -hmm. So that's the way. So that's it. Keep them all alive. Seven days from now, I'll bring rain down on the earth. See, that's number seven again. It's a tip off, priestly code. <clears throat> For 40 days and 40 nights. Again, a famous Bible number. 40 days, 40 nights. But when the Bible uses numbers, they have some symbolism to them. So, and I will wipe them from the face of the earth, every moving creature that made. Moses did just as the Lord had commanded him. And so on. Now, here again, Moses is one, excuse me, Noah is one of those guys who's got to, going to live a long life. So it says in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month. Very specific. Very specific. Uh, do you think, Father, there's, <clears throat> there's significance to the dates or the numbers like that? That would be a specific date. See, the Jewish people could look at the calendar and say it happened okay, on that day. Okay, that day. Okay. And they could celebrate or... Well, they would remember it. Remember. They would make that connection. But again, that's priestly, right? Okay. Because they would be mindful of this. <clears throat> because by now there was a calendar. Okay. Whereas in the Jake tradition, probably, maybe not, but at least not this calendar. Right. <laughs> okay. All the fountains of the great abyss burst forth, and the floodgates of the sky were open. So that was what we talked about with that. The picture at the at the beginning of Genesis, and it even has an illustration of floodgates and, mm -hmm. and the yeah mm -hmm. the thing the right yeah. the ground coming up yeah, yeah. Okay. a number of Bibles have pictures of this in there, and it's the worldview of the Hebrews, and basically it's the world under a dome. <clears throat> this is a big dome, kind of under the bubble, as we've been talking about the sports teams these mm -hmm. days. Yeah, underneath it is the waters of the abyss. Above it is the waters as well. And there's floodgates. And there's floodgates in the sky. And when you open them a little bit, you get rain. But if you open them a lot, you get a deluge. But also, if you open up the earthly gates, the waters from below come up. And so you're getting waters from both directions. And see, this will go with the way they understood the structure of the world at that time. And so they're getting it from both sides. And so the flood is complete, everything is covered, the ark floats, and now they have to wait however long it takes for it to come down. And that leads to a long wait, so that's why he needed a boat full of provisions, not just for himself, but for all the animals that went along too. Mm -hmm. And what it says there in chapter 8, the waters maintain their crest over the earth for 150 days. This is a long time, that's almost a half a year. And then, over the course of times, the waters go down, and Noah would send out birds to see what happened. The first time he sent it out, the bird flew around for a while, came back, he couldn't find anything, so Noah knew it was too soon. Second time he came back with a twig, he said, hmm, we're getting closer, but still there wasn't enough there for the bird to leave and stay. The third time the bird doesn't come back, and Noah figured out, it's time to go. Yeah. 
And so then he gets out. And so at verse 15 of chapter 8, God says to Noah, Go out of the ark together with your wife and your sons and your son's wife. Bring out with you every living creature that is with you, all bodily creatures, be they birds and animals, creeping things of the earth, and let them abound on the earth, breeding and multiplying on it. It's a restart of creation. Mm -hmm. We're starting over. So, so it's a, it's a sec and uh, yet another creation story in, mm -hmm. that's our, that'll be our third one in Genesis. Okay. Yeah, but see, this one is following the first. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's right. not an origin story, it's a reset. Reset, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. So they come out. So God repopulates the earth. So when they finish that, and we go to verse 20 of chapter 8, <clears throat> then Noah builds an altar to the Lord, and choosing from every clean animal and every clean bird, he offered holocaust on the altar. This is the first time we talk about animal sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Except for Cain's offer. See, Cain didn't offer animals. He offered grains and the fruits of his farm. And otherwise, there's no other sacrifices mentioned between Cain's and Abel's. Although Abel would have offered a sheep. When the Lord smelled the sweet order, he said to himself, Never again will I doom the earth because of man, since the desires of man's heart are evil from the start. Nor will I ever again strike down all the living beings as I have done. <clears throat> so this is pleasing to God, and God says, This isn't going to happen again. Okay. But in chapter 9, we get a covenant. This is going to be a key theme that's going to be keep repeating in the book of not just Genesis, but throughout the whole Bible. Covenant again and again and again. Chapter 9 says, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fertile and multiply and fill the earth. Dread fear of you shall come upon all the animals of the earth and all the birds of the air, upon the creatures that move about on the ground and all the fishes of the sea, into your power they are delivered. Bless you. Excuse me. Bless you. Mm -hmm. Every creature that is alive shall be yours to eat. Now we're talking about meat. Only flesh with its lifeblood still in it you shall not eat. Because blood is this, was understood to be life. And this was reserved for God. <clears throat> this is the origin of kosher food for the Jewish people that the rabbi has to approve that the blood has been drained from it and therefore it is permitted kosher to eat. Hmm. For your own lifeblood too, I will demand an accounting from every animal. <clears throat> I will demand it from man in regard to his fellow man. I will demand an accounting for human life. If anyone sheds the blood of man by man, shall his blood be shed, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for life. For in the image of God, God had man has been made. In other words, man is made in the image of God. He is to be respected and treated thusly. And then God says, See, I am now establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you. All the birds and the various tame and wild animals that were with you came out of the ark. I will establish my covenant with them that never again shall all bodily creatures be destroyed by the waters of a flood. There shall not be another flood to devastate the earth. That's where he sends the rainbow. <clears throat> That's coming right now. God added, this is the sign that I am giving for all ages to come of the covenant between you. I shall set my bow in the clouds to serve as a sign of the covenant between me and the earth, the rainbow. This is the first agreement. Because Noah showed his thanksgiving to God for the gift of life preserved through the ark. God says, I make you my people. Now you have to live up to it. <clears throat> so now we're going to finish it up. Because in chapter 10, we get another genealogy that will lead us from Noah down to the time of Abram. And that's where the age of patriarchs begins. And so there again, it's another 10, ten generation thing. And it'll go from Noah down to Ten, ten generations ten again. Ten generations again. Again, it's a linkage. Whether there's exactly ten generations, they don't know. Because this is being written long after the events occurred. But they're making sure everything's connected and tied together. The ten's a good number. Mm. Chapter 11, we get to the final story of the early books of the Bible. The Tower of Babel. 
And again, I think we know this story, but we have to see its significance. Right. It's our Babel. The whole world spoke the same language, using the same words. While men were migrating in the east, they came upon a valley in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come, let us mold bricks and harden them with fire. Okay, more technology. They know how to build things now. Bricks, and with bricks you can build lots of stuff. They used bricks for stone and bitumen for mortar. Okay, technology's coming along. They were able to build things. Then they said, come let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Why go up that high? Well, that's where God is. So they want to crawl up to heaven and be with God. And so make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered all over the earth. That's right, guys. You've got it right. Okay. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men had built. Then the Lord said, If now, while they are one people, all speaking the same language, they have started to do this, nothing will later stop them from doing whatever they presume to do. I'll fix that. Let us go down there and confuse their language so that one will not be able to understand the other. Did this actually happen? Who knows? But I know this much. There's different languages. And this was a way of explaining how do all these languages spring up. Okay. Again, it's a sign of the evil that was taking place. So that would be an explanation that the Bible offers in this case. So not only is there now a confusion of languages and many languages existing, the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth and the city stopped being built. So, so that explains how people spread out over the whole kingdom too, and the whole planet. See, the Bible is answering these fundamental questions in a particular way, it is as an effect of the evil of humanity caused them to be scattered. And now they're gonna be competing with each other. And it pretty much explains how did everything end up the way it is today? Well, this is how it happened. Okay, and so that's what there. Now the story of Babel kind of fits in somewhere after Noah. It's really not at a certain point. It's just kind of an independent entity because again, you've got that genealogy which picks up with Shem and goes down to the time of patriarch Abraham. Or as he's known in the early part of the Bible, Abram. And that's where the covenant history begins to really fold and take shape. So this is kind of a quick one hour rapid trip through the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. Comments? It's, it's a lot. We did, but you did cover a lot of stuff, Father. <laughs> but it's enlightening. You know, it gives you an idea. You know, it can answer some questions we may have. It's like, well, that makes sense <laughs> you know that's why we're all like we are and then even though um god sent the flood and and destroyed all the evil people except noah and his family it's coming back again yes well that that started with ham disrespecting his father right and, and is, so it started right away right there and actually Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it would have happened inevitably because there is this proclivity to evil as a result of what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. Okay, right. Part of that original sin. The original that sin, yeah. In other words, there is this tendency to push the edge because, again, you see that people keep trying to get up to be with God. And God keeps slapping them down and saying, you're not getting up here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, and then I, had a note, I had a note about Babel or Babylon. Yeah. Yeah, that's kingdom of the east. And again, that reflects the priestly code because that's where the priestly code probably took its roots during the exile in Babylon during the 6th century BC. And so they would have seen this. And there's some thought that the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which was one of those great wonders of the ancient road, world, could have been a kind of a model for the Garden of Eden. I wonder to explain what kind of garden was this? Well, it was something like that. Something awesome, spectacular, and perfectly peaceful. Hmm. Okay. 
So there's a lot of fringe things there. So we've set the stage for Abraham, and when we come back next week at the same time, next Tuesday, we'll pick it up at that point. So having come this far, it's time to say goodnight, and we'll close with our ending prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the Consoler. Blessed be the great Mother of God, Mary, most holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, virgin and mother. Blessed be St. Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you.